Uh, thank you all for coming to today's talk. As I believe you all know, I'm Damian Vergara Wilson, and I'm presenting uh, with Jorge today uh, about uh, critical language awareness. Uh, and we'll get all into that. Uh, we are going to present this work uh, in a little more than a week uh, in Boston at the 10th uh, National Symposium on Spanish as a Heritage Language. And uh, so uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to get uh, feedback from uh, all these esteemed uh, peers here. And we also recognize that today is a really wild day. You know, April is super busy. And so we are grateful uh, for each and every one of you being here uh, during this very stimulating month full of activity. And, uh, you know, so many ideas out of today looking at uh, the presentation that came before us, Kim's talk. And so, uh, you know, once again, uh, thank you very, very much uh, for hanging out with us. And so we're going to be talking about uh, critical language awareness, which is something that I push a lot in the Spanish as a Heritage Language program. And uh, while there are many different definitions, uh, including ones that are much more original, uh, we uh, like to use this one from Lehman that talks about how CLA has been applied to the understanding of how language is imbued with social meaning and power relations as well as to pedagogical approaches uh, designed to promote that understanding among students. As part of their learning about how language works, uh, CLA-based uh, pedagogies encourage students to question taken for granted assumptions about language and how to analyze how such assumptions are tied to inequality and injustice with the ultimate goal of promoting positive social change. Uh, one of the conversations I was in today was about the word I got. Uh, and as we know, that word itself draws a lot of admonitions, and the Real Academia Española has actually updated their definition of it uh, to say that it is an incorrect form, uh, yet used by you know, millions of speakers. And so what critical language awareness does is draws attention to the fact that this is arbitrary, uh, that uh, denominating AIGA as incorrect by the Real Academia is uh, classist, and you know, kind of getting into some of the reasons why they would do this, even though it is used by millions of speakers. And so it invites students, especially of stigmatized varieties of a language, to engage in uh, thought processes, dialogues, and explorations that go beyond these assumptions. Because uh, when we talk about these um, you know, uh, taken for granted assumptions, when you look at the Real Academia Española, you assume that they are the authority. And so, you know, many uh, students will internalize that, you know, I got just wrong, and so my grandmother is wrong, and my parents are wrong, and so, you know, I'm going to uh, modify my speech uh, to talk in a way that alienates me from my own speech community. And so that's kind of an overview of critical language awareness. Uh, it is a critical pedagogy that is, uh, comes from uh, Freire. So, uh, it's in gained increased attention from practitioners uh, as we encourage our students to question these assumptions. Uh, however, a lot of the scholarship on critical language awareness uh, implicitly positions it as an approach that is mainly understood and imparted by linguists. So us linguists have sort of put a fence around it, and we talk about it in a way that's uh, you know aimed for linguists, uh, that is designed to get linguists fired up, and uh, so what we're doing today is we are expanding that. You know, but if you look at uh, examples of this, a recent uh, publication on uh, heritage language teaching, critical language awareness perspectives for research and pedagogy, uh, uh, one to which I contributed, you know, has really valuable innovations uh, compiled on the topic of CLA, but does not have a chapter focusing on how to use literature to teach uh, critical language awareness. But, you know, at the same time, some of the chapters allude to the importance of literature. You know, uh, the chapter I wrote with Sarah, we argue that uh, we should use genres such as poetry, uh, novels, art, etc., and music as targets for the analysis of the author's purposeful choices as well as the underlying ideologies and perspectives. But we don't really give you a way to do it. And I'm starting to, so once again, this, uh, what Jorge and I are doing is attempting to rectify that. Uh, Olgi Mendoza is an example of using a corrido for developing uh, language legitimacy, linguistic expansion, and critical awareness. And although in her chapter she doesn't go through how to develop critical language awareness under, uh, with student groups, uh, but uh, she actually has uh, a massive uh, set of pedagogical 
you know, interventions and activities uh, that she has been able to spearhead, and so she's actually giving a lot of guidance. But if you go through her materials, you will see that she and her colleagues don't really talk about literature, per se, very much, although they do talk a lot about uh, pop culture. Okay. Um, in a different uh, volume on uh, SHL teaching, Aguilo and Mora, uh, Aguilo, Mora, and Lynch argue for using uh, U.S. Latina literature and implicitly point to ways that this way it may contribute to CLA. But you know, uh, so what we're doing is that we don't mean to criticize the aforementioned works necessarily, but we're suggesting another productive avenue for creative for uh, critical language awareness, which is a focus on literature and including our colleagues in cultural studies and lit uh, in these conversations because uh, we hope that by the end of this talk to have demonstrated that the study of literature just is inherently imbued itself with uh, notions uh, of critical language awareness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, another thing that we've observed that uh, has been happening and that we're trying to rectify is that, uh, you know, we go to conferences, we talk about these things, it's theoretical, you know, we have our tea, we have our cookies, we feel good, we get on the plane, we're smiling, and then you get home, and how do you, uh, you know, implement it? So this is also, uh, not only do I want to push the conversation into, uh, you know, including, uh, you know, uh, scholars in literature and cultural studies, but we also just need to include everybody by making it more concrete. And so recently in a project with Marcin, a really neat project that we did with, uh, during the pandemic by having uh, student communities in New York and New Mexico collaborate on a number of activities, uh, we studied uh, student expressions uh, and the students' work and did interviews with the students to determine you know, how they viewed some of the uh, attempts that we did to foster critical language awareness and came up with uh, the following measurable outcomes. You know, number one being that the, uh, the student is able to contextualize the listener on how language is imbued with social meaning and power relations, uh, that they uh, critique well-established assumptions and ideologies about language. And it's terrible because I'm obsessed with ideologies, and once you start seeing them, you can't stop. Uh, and then to assess how such assumptions and ideologies are tied to inequality and injustice and to um, formulate ways to promote positive social change. So uh, typically institutional uh, measurable outcomes are very dry and seco, uh, and what we're trying to do is create uh, uh, you know, learning outcomes, measurable outcomes that are re related to critical pedagogies. A couple of years ago I had the opportunity to work uh, uh, with a state level committee on student learning outcomes for uh, Spanish classes, for Spanish as a heritage language classes, and I snuck in a critical uh, language awareness one uh, so that uh, educators across the state, when they approach the teaching of SHL, uh, at least have to read it and say that they should be doing that. Uh, so this is all part of an effort to make it more concrete. Okay, so uh, this is echoed, and I'll just show one more slide here by uh, my colleagues, uh, Baudria Mesqua and Loza, uh, who also pro uh, who are promoting you know, the following learning goals, once again, in an effort to make this concrete, instead of this wonderful, you know, highly theoretical thing that we all great about at conferences and you know so their learning goals are very similar to the ones that I just showed you the students will be able to see language variation as natural and recognize the intrinsic value of their own variety and others uh, that um, students will be able to develop a consciousness of the political social and economic power structures that underlie language use and the distribution of the so class prestige and non prestige varieties Students will be able to uncover dominant language ideologies that hide in daily monolingual and bilingual practices, and the students will be empowered to exercise agency in making their own decisions about language use and bilingualism. And so now I will let Jorge guide us through some of uh, the things that we have been thinking about. It's like it's sort of like being like a lightsaber. Yeah, it's a lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> I passed the lightsaber. Well, while you're watching that, the new uh, Mandalorian bit of window done. So, you know, thanks so much. I feel so excited to be with all of you. So it's, you know, I feel very, very privileged to share this with you. But you know, we're going to do something a little bit different here. Right? Um, normally, we would discuss these CLA and these learning goals and apply them to you know, how we implement CLA in the classroom. However, I kind of want to do something a little bit different because rather than seeing these just as goals, 
What I want to do is posit them as questions. That is the way that we would use as a Lua's text in the classroom. Right? So that is also a way to foment critical consciousness. A critical language awareness and consciousness among uh, our group today. It's not even critical here. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so before anything, right, um, I remember, you know, you know, I guess we've had a lot of conversations over over the years. So like, this is something that we've just been meaning to do, and you know, we've been doing this for, you know, we've, we've been working a while on this, but um, you know, I just want to say Gloria has some love for Sam. I want I want to acknowledge that and uh, the fact that you know, even though Asadu has been you know, long, 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 has been long gone, the fact that she continues to be in these discussions that we hold in class, and the fact that you know, now that we kind of building bridges between uh, you know scholars of, of linguistics and scholars of literature and scholars of cultural studies, you know, you know, you never know. You know, my, we might have to extend this to mathematicians someday. Critical <laughs> <laughs> math. Uh, but you know, I remember in reading a long time ago, you know, when the great Chicano writer Tomas uh, Tomas Rivera uh, talked about when he picked up a, a book called uh, "With His Pistol in His Hand" by the Central scholar, Mexican American scholar Domenico Paredes. Uh, to me, this was kind of my Rivera moment whenever I first found uh, Borderlands. I found, I, I, I saw myself represented in that book, and this was many, many moons ago. Uh, however, it's, you know, I, I, I feel now that as an educator, um, this has really illuminated my path, of, you know, my, my students' past as well. But I want to stop very, very briefly saying that, you know, Grant Seville was a Chicano writer, Chicana writer uh, poet, cultural, and feminist theorist. Um, if you're going to do that, you will find out anything from et ethnic studies, linguistics, co uh, cultural studies, literature. Um, and Sadua's name has, has circulated very widely. That way. Gracias, like Sadua. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but her seminal, seminal work, Ordenas de Frontera, allows us to do a variety of things. It allows us to kind of remap our understanding of what a border is. Um, not just as a simple, you know, divide between here and there, you know, presenter and audience, um, or there and us, us and them, but also more profoundly as a psychic, as a social, and as a cultural terrain that, you know, that, that we all inhabit and that in turn inhabits us. Right. Uh, and so she presents the idea of language as a, you know, as, as a language in a, in a living image. And within, in, in Twix, in Twix with, with our identity. And for us, this is particularly compelling because she writes about, even though uh, Borderlands is a very theoretical book for those who have uh, the privilege to read it, but she also recounts uh, her lifelong struggle in her use of, uh, of Chicano Spanish and, and her accent. Okay. And so Borderlands allows students to frame their own linguistic experiences within the critical and theoretical framework that Ansaldua provides for us as readers. For us, particularly for this presentation, you know, Borderlands has been used, as I've already mentioned, you know, has been used in a you know, wide variety of settings. And it's been used because of its potential to promote criticality. For us, it allows us to promote CLA in the uh, yeah, Spanish as a heritage language okay. And so now, as I said, we want to provide a roadmap, and we kind of want to flip those uh, CLA goals provided by Baudry and Mascarenhosa. And to a great extent, you know, Anselm Duarte talks about language and its intrinsic value. What is her perspective on language variation? Does she privilege certain varieties over others? You know, I see that Ansaldúa uses and sees language as a connection to identity, um, capable of communicating realities and, and values to our true selves. And she does this neither in Espanol nor in Inglés, but something in between, right? in lenguaje de la frontera. She sees language as something that is natural. For her, language and identity go hand in hand together and quote, because we are a complex, heterogeneous people, we speak many languages. In our class, in our Spanish as the Heritage Summers classes, we ask these questions to students. I, I, I particularly ask these, these questions to my students in SHL4 
um, as a primer to foment uh, critical consciousness about their linguistic varieties, registers, and the links. And so we introduce these kind of very linguistic uh, terminologies so that students can become aware of their sociolinguistic socio context and backgrounds. And so now I'm going to break the fourth wall of the presentations. <laughs> I might use the fourth. I'm a, I'm a, you I do that part. And so now for, for the audience, you know, I'll, I'm going to ask you all how would you greet your grandmother on a Sunday afternoon versus a best friend you haven't seen in a year? What about your parents? In Portuguese, in Spanish, in Hola, bonita, buenos días. ¿Cómo está? How are you doing? Uh, if, your, if your grandma is like me, like, you know, like uh, a Chicana grandma, like, hey, go now. Hey, uh, hey, what's going on? Uh, uh, <laughs> grandma. <laughs> Chicana grandma, you know, like, be hardcore. But we ask these questions to our students so that they can become aware of these, of these kind of things, right? Although, you know, recognizing the, the first part, you know, CLA, LA language awareness is very important, right? This is still not enough to promote the second kind of uh, rung of, of critical language. So I think we need a little bit more. However, this is a very good way to kind of plant that seed in your students. Like, wait, how do I speak to different people? How do I speak to my grandma, my dad, my sister, about my novia, my girlfriend? And nowadays, you know, toxicos and toxicos. <laughs> so that's pretty cool, you know, like critical language awareness through, through these kind of, of relationships. One of the most important parts of Los Angeles overall, uh, an overarching uh, theme throughout the book is critical consciousness. And so Los constructs a critical consciousness that she calls it una conciencia mestiza of the borderlands. But just how does she develop a consciousness of the powers that underlie language use and its dis distribution through class and prestige varieties. In her work, she constructs the Mestiza consciousness as a dynamic, as a new mythos capable of breaking down the dualistic hegemonic paradigms that inherently exist in language. By creating a new mythos, a new consciousness, una nueva conciencia, una conciencia mestiza, we may change the way that we perceive reality, the way we understand ourselves and our language and our identities. And so Ansaldua's uh, consciousness raising, through her writing, allows our students to see themselves represented in her writings and her experiences. It allows them to create their own mestizo or mestiza consciousness. And so by fomenting CLA or by fomenting the criticality of CLA in the English language classroom, students may be able to identify, analyze, and critique how these hegemonic linguistic paradigms contribute to the linguistic oppression and the discrimination in our communities and society. Part of developing a consciousness, part of creating a critical consciousness of the language is critiquing these inherent dominant ideologies that exist out there in the vacuum and mainly often in academia. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Ansaldoa is, is although she does not put it this way, she does not mention I am critiquing you know race and linguistic and standard language ideologies, uh, although she does to some extent, but you know how does she uncover these dominant language ideologies that that hide in our daily uh, monolingual and bilingual practices? Particularly in her chapter, How to Tame a Wild Tongue, Asadua talks about how linguistic terrorism is often embedded in the internalized uh, in, and internalized in the practices of our everyday practices. For her, these discriminatory or um, discriminatory and linguistic practices exist not just at the macro level uh, of our linguistic hegemony, but also in the innermost part of our beings. And so we often internalize these ideologies as deficits about our language because it has been used against us. And sometimes in turn, we often weaponize language 
um, against others and often ourselves or consciously. For our students, this means identifying, recognizing, and critiquing these embedded and often unconscious practices within their own language and within their own day-to-day uh, -day practices. It also means unlearning these dominant uh, ideological practices and their imposition upon others, all while embracing our language, our experiences, and becoming critically aware of the linguistic experiences of others. In doing so, we are able to dismantle these ideologies. We are able to break them down, as I said, uh, constantly quotes. Um, and we also are able to break down these ideologies that often we have about ourselves um, in our communities. I want to do one thing because I, this is one of those quotes that I've gone through through the years and years and years. And you know, Ansa Lua has circled in, in many circles. But whenever it comes to this particular quote, um, I, I simply love it. And I'm going to quote at length because uh, Ansa Lua wrote, <laughs> wrote it so. So, in terms of empowerment and agency, she provides us a lot, a lot. But quote, so if you really want to hurt me, talk badly about my language. Ethnic identity is twin skin to linguistic identity. I am my language. Until I cannot accept, I, until I can accept as, oh, try it again. <laughs> until I can take part of my language, I cannot take part of myself. Until I can accept as legitimate Chicano, Tech Spanish, Tex Mex, and other languages I speak, I cannot accept the legitimacy of myself. Until I am free to write bilingually and to switch codes without having to translate, while I have to speak English or Spanish, or when I would rather speak Spanglish, and as long as I have to accommodate the English speakers rather than having them to accommodate to me, my tongue would be illegitimate. I will no longer ma uh, be made to feel ashamed of existing. I will have my voice, Indian, Spanish, white. I will have my serpent's tongue, my woman's voice, my sexual voice, my poet's voice. I will overcome a traditional sentence. And so just with that, it's like, every time I read that, it's, it's very impactful for me. And so I'm so do constantly, constantly uh, push, positions herself in the spirit of social activism uh, as a catalyst for change. But specifically, you know, how does she empower us uh, and exercise agency while making her own decision on language use and bilingualism? She empowers us by you know, letting us know that it's important to take pride in the language, in our identity. She provides us with this agency by retroactive, retroactively allowing us to validate uh, and value our own, the own legitimacy of our own language. She does this so by taking pride in her servant's tongue, so that we may also recognize the value of our language. For our students, this means empowering, empowering them so that they may recognize and validate the power and importance of their language and identity. And so, particularly for us as instructors and students, I will always be a student. <laughs> this means building strong connections uh, amongst ourselves in in class and beyond, in our families and in our, in our communities, because that is the overall of our program. Um, yes, the, the language classroom is amazing, but the ultimate goal is to take that beyond. And so taken together, taken collectively, this means taking pride in our language and identity through the powerful act of storytelling. Um, Damiana and I always ramble this to Damiana, but I think one of the uh, overarching uh, themes that we had over years in our program is Cuenta tu historia, tell your story. Um, I feel that after when students have read and said less story, um, it facilitates that, that powerful act for, for them to tell the story. Of them. And so, Ansadua does this throughout the work. So, the question is what comes next? How do we apply Borderlands to our class? Uh, what other cultural texts can we use to foment CLA in the SHL classroom or in the language classroom in general? 
And there are a few options. There's a variety of options that actually there's a plethora of things that you can do. However, you know, I think that we can use a variety of readings in the SHL classroom in the language classroom, um, in addition to as a less ordinance. But the following is a non-exhaustive exhaustive list. <laughs> I have the power of mm. uh, And so the following are actual works that we have used uh, in various uh, capacities in our language program. Uh, we have from growing porque uh, únicas cónicas diabólicas that can be used to examine uh, language ideologies at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, we have Inocente de la Tierra by Tomás Rivera, um, whose book uh, is, who allows us to anal analyze uh, you know, literary structures, uh, fragmented narratives, and non-linear structures. Uh, Susana chavez Silverman's fantastic, fantastic book, Quiero uh, Crónicas, <laughs> maybe used to examine the dynamism of you know, like trans-Hispanic uh, bilingual translingual speakers. Although the following is a children's book, Chato y los Amigos Pachangueros, you know, helps us use to examine you know, the, the inherent language and language in children's books. So CLA can also have that, have that reach. Uh, and often children's books are embedded with uh, open ideologies, ideologies, ideologies. And even works such as uh, Carmen Gómez Garza's Cuadros de Familia, which is a very visual book, allows us to kind of examine language through a visual component. Um, the following, we used it sparingly, but whenever I have a point in class, I found that students really enjoy the fact that uh, Santa Fe Nativa, a collection of no Mexican writing by uh, our own, Gloria Menendez, Los Otero, Enrique de Madrid. It's a really, really cool bilingual book that includes a English version and a Spanish version, all on the same page. So, that's, that's about it. And so, like, uh, you know, using literary text <clears throat> to promote criticality is a very wide topic. And, you know, uh, one of the reasons I've been uh, preoccupied with this uh, exact topic of, you know, how do we extend the conversation to uh, people working in literature and culture studies is because just as coordinating the SHL program, I don't get to like decide to only you know recruit linguists to teach with me and uh, and I've witnessed personally how you know uh, literature uh, approaches just naturally uh, foster critical language awareness. Part of our conversations were even like how <coughs> you could use El Quijote to promote CLA because of the really um, you know uh, the, the attention to uh, social class that Cervantes uh, pays in you know. Uh, making Sancho Panza speak a certain way is very detectably different from you know the higher class characters uh, such as El Quijote. And although you know the, the, the list that he presented, you know, all the all the uh, actually all the works come from uh, uh, the standpoint of the Mexican American, the Mexican and Mexican American community, right? Um, you know we can voice the way through a variety of texts. It's just this is just a particular yeah. example for uh, for our students and for our population here and there. Um, I imagine you know. Uh, uh, educators in other institutions can find text that can uh, be used to, to teach that those particular certain populations. So um, that's another that's a whole other project and a whole other presentation. Oh, yeah. But you know we we've had these talks for I mean over a year now. It's, uh, but uh, you know so once again we're just uh, this is a conversation to be more inclusive. Uh, you know as a linguist and you know uh, recognizing that. The inherent, uh, you know, characteristics uh, that are imbued in uh, cultural studies and literature, and you know, students engage in critical readings of books that reflect their uh, reality and sociolinguistic backgrounds might feel validated just naturally. They may come to new insights about their own positionality. You know, uh, engagement with ideological circumstances, you know, uh, promotes critical language awareness and also might promote agency. So maybe students who once felt inhibited in using their natural dialect uh, through looking at, uh, you know, uh, Ansaldua's work with a special attention with, uh, you know, focusing the lens on the critical language awareness element might uh, decide that they're going to put their foot down and say, I got any uh, propositions that uh, elevate everybody 
uh, to people who bring important things to the conversation. You know, all of our students are important funds of uh, knowledge. And um, once again, I'm just going to close with this, uh, that this is an invitation for scholars of both literature, cultural studies, and linguistics to find ways to join efforts to foment CLA using their areas of expertise. And so in our department, there's a lot of conversations about how we are one department and, you know, uh, we are doing, a lot of us are doing this. Uh, people who've been studying CLA and operationalizing it have found that, uh, you know, it's there. There's a tremendous potential resource amongst uh, people who are, uh, you know, uh, passionate enough to study languages these days. And so uh, basically, we just want to uh, keep that going. So, muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. So now you're invited to the party. Yeah. <laughs> the CLA party. So, CLA, Lit, and Cultural Studies. Yes. So anyways, uh, thank you all once again, thanks for coming on this very, very busy day. And uh, uh, as you know, this is we're going to present this at a conference in a little more than a week. So any uh, suggestions, comments, questions, lo que sea, si, si quieren decir algo o no decir algo, pues. Where? Where's it going to be? Uh, this is in, in Boston. You might want to, I mean, add, I, I think you would, you, you could add uh, something for like the, the Northeastern community by uh, maybe, um, maybe Tato La Viera, yeah. mm -hmm. Este, or, or, or even P.D. Thomas, right? Yeah. Yeah. Some streets. Great idea. Si, San, si, si. Santa Maria Esteves. Right, it's a really great new American poetry. Right, because if we're reaching out and trying to <laughs> talk the conversation, then okay, that's a great suggestion. Okay. Maria. Um, so you have to go in line with, you know, um, contextualizing the readings per location, right? Because SHL is, should be everywhere, right? SHL classroom should be everywhere. Um, however, we know that in some places they are more welcome and more successful than in other places, right? So my, I guess my question is, you know, like how, here in the Southwest, there's like a, a, like a plethora of texts that we can use because of writers that have come out of here, like, like Anaya, right? Um, coming from California, like it wasn't an emphasis in my education, so you know, my question is how, how can we actually increase the amount of uh, culturally aware, like aware, culturally, linguistically aware texts coming up from different geographical places to have there be more representation from those, you know, um, geographical locations to have it be or compared to New Mexico, if that makes sense, you know, because we have so much of it in the Southwest. What about places like for the Comunidad Hispana, the people living in Vermont or something, you know? Right. I mean, I don't. I mean, you know. I mean, I've been, I've been, I, 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 I taught SHL um, when I was teaching at Penn State 20 years ago, mm. right? And a lot of the material that I, we've talked about this material that I did, was coming out of that, actually New Mexico, but I had to tailor it. <laughs> I had to tailor it to uh, to my my students, who my Latino students were primarily right from the Caribbean, right? From either Puerto Rican straight from the island, or from or from New York or or uh, or Philadelphia. So yes, right. Look for material that is pertinent to that readership. I mean, I, I would teach Chicano kind of literature classes, and I was, and I remember teaching um, Rolando Hinojosa's Estampas del Valle, and all of my students, well, all of my Caribeño students, freaked out, right? And they were like, they were, they, 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 they were saying, I don't know what this is. I thought I spoke the language, right? Because it's very much a border Spanish, right? Very Tejano. And, uh, and you know, my suggestion, my recommendation for them back then, this is something that I do even today, is I said, when, you, when you're reading this literature, read it out loud. Because especially with Inojosa, right, it's all about ear, right? And, uh, and so, and, and that was like a click with my students. They said, you know, it's, it sounded like a silly comment from me, from the professor, read it out loud, but once you read it out loud, you could sort of like hear the cadence and hear what was going on. Because I, I would continuously get students who would be like, I called my mom and I called my mom in San Juan and, and I said, what is this? And asked, what is this? I don't know what this is. And then I, 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 would, be, and I would say, well, look, just read it out loud and you'll get to hear the, 
thing. So yes, so the trick is, right? Looking for it. Looking for it, right? Looking, and, and, and as, as, as educators, right, when we find ourselves in the classroom, right, try to include material that is, that is pertinent to the, to the region or the community that we're, that we're working with. Yeah. But my question is increasing that level of creative works. Right. right. And so maybe, you know, AFTA in Programa Plus U at Stanford, we can try to promote like that increased level of creative works as opposed to like just, or not just, you know, Biddle, because there's so much um, uh, privilege, not privilege, um, like so much priority given to like research papers, right? Mm -hmm. So how to really increase uh, creative works to mm -hmm. better have this type of representation in SHL classrooms later on. Right. But especially in other in other states that that is right now are not um, don't have that amount of work as opposed to states like New Mexico or right. you know Arizona Southwest. Well, that's that's working with the with with the faculty, right? I mean, that's always going to be the the departmental identity, yeah. right? Especially. You know, I'm, I'm, I've always been the weirdo in, in, in all the other departments where I've taught. Uh, and I ended up, ended up in a department of weirdos right, where we're all looking at. And, and these are precisely the questions that we, that, we, that, we, that we look at and we're interested in. But yes, right, you know, and when I first started teaching SHL, it was like 20 years ago, right, it was like uh, almost unheard of in the, in the region. Hmm. Um, and this is why like all the material that I was getting was coming out of Mexico. Um, so yeah, but it's, that's, uh, those are shifts that, that, that that, that 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 are happening at the uh, 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 in, in in the academy and, and in some places it's a lot slower than 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 others. Right? I would say get with the program, but uh. but, okay, but just to wrap up on that, you know, also um, you know, Maria, it's like you know, trying to do what we're doing here, which is like opening up the gates, you know, because you know, all of the my experience in the last decade that talking about CLA has been with linguists talking about linguistic concepts when. You know, uh, like I said when we started this talk, I think that a lot of just teaching literature in with a slightly critical lens, you know, has a possibility of really, you know, uh, promoting you know uh, critical pedagogies, whether you intend to or not. Sometimes, <laughs> and so like, you know, part of what I'm hoping to do is make it concrete, so you know that you're doing it, and so that you can like do it deliberately in a way that like gets students to, you know, uh, do that. But yeah, I think part of it is just getting people excited, making it concrete, making it seem doable. And uh, you know, getting people excited about it instead of fencing it off, like, oh yeah. no, only linguists do this. But yeah. well, let's, let's do Mary, and then and, uh, I would also like to say, you know, I guess you know, part of this, you know, trying to, to bridge these things and trying to, to make these things concrete is also kind of you know, raising raising awareness and raising mm -hmm. the consciousness of the importance of incorporating these kinds of texts into our classrooms, yeah. uh, whether it be here in the Southwest. Just say yo in California, mm -hmm. up there in the Northeast, mm -hmm. where the large uh, indigenous community and uh, migrant Mexican communities uh, exist, uh, out there in the Latino mm -hmm. Midwest, mm -hmm. uh, in you know, the eastern part of the U.S. I think it's you know it's it's part of a collaborative effort, and it's also part of a collaborative uh, growing consciousness that we we need to show with others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thanks so much. I I am wondering if you thought about even pushing this a little bit further beyond um, language usage, because if you think about it in terms of a thematic, like what you're arguing for or against is a kind of definite binarism, right? Mm -hmm. Like a right, wrong. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that in terms of literature, and since you cited the Quixote, um, you know, so much of, like I teach mostly the 17th century, and so much of what I teach is about is against you know, hegemony against oppression, right, and using literature to sort of interrogate that gray space, right, mm -hmm. between right and wrong. And so I think that there's um, a real place for you to extend this, if you wanted to, to things that aren't as obviously um, attuned to sort of language difference, but even a little kind of, you know, taking the marco, making it a little bigger and thinking about it in terms uh, of thematics, right? And so it's not just about Sancho's lower class Spanish, uh, mm -hmm. to say it as such, but it's also about the fact that Cervantes gives Marcela space to talk about her experience as a woman in the 17th century who just wants to be free and have men leave her alone, right? And, and then the other men that come into that episode and give their opinion about her and what you have in that moment, you have this huge sort of multi-perspectivism about that interrogates what truth is, right? And so whose truth is valid and which truth gets to be told? And I think in any, um, in literature, in any instance where you have authors sort of writing against oppression, that's 
that's what they're going to be getting at, right? Because the same thing happens in 20th century Spain under Franco, right? So I think there are all these cool moments that you could um, hone in on and take this, make this even sort of a, a sort of macro argument too, from the language out, you know. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of opportunities for emancipatory teaching, you know, yeah. right? and sometimes, you know, in the if you get it from the least expected places, it yeah. has an even bigger impact because of the surprise factor. So yeah, that's yeah. a great idea. Let's go. We'll go here, and then we'll go. Uh, let's see. So you first, and then I'll just follow my vision <laughs> this way. Yeah. <laughs> you all are okay with that. I was going to say, kind of going off of Maria's question as well. I also see it as sort of like a, a self uh, like a snowball that can keep rolling too. Like the more students go through critical language awareness classes, the more confidence they'll have in putting out their own thoughts and own literature, and that will just increase the amount of literature that we have to share in classes in all the different fields. And it'll just keep perpetuating itself. So. That's what we hope. That's what we hope. Yeah, it's like a revolution. <laughs> yeah, but, you, but once again, you got to get people excited and make them think, mm -hmm. see that way. That, you know, and I know that this is kind of preliminary, but starting to give like concrete steps so that people can think, you know, oh, this isn't just something that that uh, Damian guy and Jorge up there were all contando su historia, yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, but I can do this, or, you know, this is an element that I could easily incorporate into my own teaching without having to, like, you know, uh, do linguistic anthropology, you know, so. Eleuterio, we'll start with you. From the side. A suggestion first. For, for the presentation, I think that it would be helpful to have examples, some examples, uh, to see to see the language acting in a, in, a, in a, and and it's it's tricky, you know, in my in my own writing or in my own uh, questioning of my language. Um, I have realized that in the case of Puerto Rico, no, which is um, in the case of Puerto Rico, we all. We all always saw that the uh, popular word was going to be the um, the way to go. Mm -hmm. But there are processes that are interesting. What we have in reality is an heteroglossia, no? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, things, um, people from the, from, I remember what, when we have a very, a very uh, a televised trial. It was the first time that we have a trial televised in, the, in, in Puerto Rico. And suddenly, people were using the, people from the from the low strata of the society were using the language of the lawyer, mm. <laughs> parodying the the language mm. constantly, mm. and the and the language of the police. They immediately incorporate the language of the police. For instance, instead of saying un chamaco, uh, they will say un individuo sospechoso. <laughs> 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 I'm joking, no? Like Baquera arrived and I said, be careful, un individuo sospechoso. <laughs> people, were doing, no, people were doing that all the time. They do it with the language of, of, of wrestling. Um, they do it even with literature. Mm -hmm. So that process of heteroglossia shows uh, how uh, what was um, the norm mm -hmm. can be incorporated in part of it. Mm -hmm. And become part of the of the. So I would like, if for the presentation, it would be helpful for me to see uh, the interacting of the norm and the and the and the popular language in 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 process, no? Right. Make it even more concrete. <laughs> totally no, a little bit more. See, yeah, some examples because okay. I understand what you are saying, but seeing the norm, I didn't see the norm there. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, the literature that you are promoting. I, I, didn't see, I didn't see the process of breaking. Ah. Mm -hmm. Excellent comment. Hold on, we'll get there. We're going to go Jacinto, and then Marco, and then Kai. Um, I know that SHL is helping me kind of break the cycle for being intimidated. Because instead of looking at foreign, it was like, no, this is, it, it was, this is who you are. And it was in a class with rich and being a linguist. I mean, the fact that he said, you know, mm -hmm. Or wrong Spanish and and that right there was just it was just incredible. So for me, with CLA, it allows me to it, it it makes it bigger for me to come in and say, you know what, the way I grew up, whatever's going through my head, hold myself back. But for me, I say, has been very healing, and that's why I feel that this is the same. Like, no, we're treating it like this is from where you're from, wherever you got stuck, whether linguistically or whether you got stuck from being embarrassed, whatever it was, it's all right. 
we're going to help patch those holes. So that's how I feel for the SHM. It treats us like like we learn English here you know, in the United States. We, we don't learn as a foreign language. Mm -hmm. So I like that. Yeah, yeah, it's just flipping the script that like Spanish does not belong with the U.S. Spanish is positioned as a foreign language yeah. and you know, making it inclusive. No, it's just foreign to English. <laughs> <laughs> Marco. Bueno, yo, una <coughs> muy buena presentación, pero solo quería saber si hablamos en el contexto de expander, ¿no? expander el trabajo, ¿cómo, inclu o cómo incluirían o cómo se incluiría si se beneficia o no se beneficia the non-Spanish speakers, the non-native Spanish speakers, ¿no? Y excluyendo de que son generaciones de México, no, sino que los americanos, los franceses, inclusive hindús que quieran aprender el español, ¿cómo eso se ve reflejado dentro del proyecto? ¿Cómo podría? Si llamamos de que queremos extender, ¿no? ¿Cómo podemos extender un poco la cultura más? Porque lo vemos hoy recientemente con las conexiones y cómo interactuamos con las personas, ¿no? Tenemos estudiantes que son americanos, pero que quieren aprender más allá de los requirements, ¿no? Entonces, ¿cómo expandemos quizá esas voces o cómo logramos meterlos dentro de la conversación, de nuestra conversación? Pues, crucial, crucial, porque... Eh, muchas veces se enseña el español como segunda lengua en eh, una manera muy como sanitizada, si me explico, como si fuera algo sin política, sin ramificaciones sociales. Entonces, eh, pues para comenzar, explo eh, recomendaría explorar las decisiones que se hacen al crear un libro de texto de, pues, hacer que los estudiantes memoricen conjugaciones de vosotros, pero hacer caso omiso total de voceo, aunque hay más hablantes que usan el voz que vosotros. Entonces, y, y ver, explorar un poquito las decisiones que hacen en la creación de esos libros. A, abrir la página inevitable de los mapas lingüísticos que muestran el mundo donde se habla el español y muestra todos los países estos o dichos hispanohablantes, menos Estados Unidos, aunque uh, depende del día y los datos, solo hay como cuatro o tres países con más hispanohablantes uh, que nosotros. Entonces, incluir a toda la gente, yo, yo creo que, no tengo todas las respuestas, pero yo creo que con un poco de creatividad, uh, esas invitaciones son uh, muy importantes porque, uh, you know, people are heavily ideologized through these L2 textbooks, whether they know it or not, they're heavily ideologized. They come out of these uh, classes with, they, they don't even know it, but you know, suddenly, you know, it's a polígrafo, no es una pluma, you know, and everybody around you is saying pluma, but you know the right word. And so you become heavily ideologized. So I think, you know, recognizing that, saying, look, class, we have this amazing tool here, it's going to help us to, you know, increase our linguistic capabilities, but there's also, gives us an opportunity to look at critical things. So, You know, I think that that's just a conversation, just como para comenzar. Y desde ahí yo creo que hay, hay muchas oportunidades. And uh, just in some of my own research uh, with that I did with Marcin, we had L2 students. It was a mixed group. And so, you know, we we're watching how L2 students, like, really, like, you know, this one, he, he reported, he was like, he, he said something like, antes yo vivía como en una caja. You know, había muchos hispanohablantes, but after this class and all the critical uh, things that we were doing, which were mainly linguistics projects, you know, vio como una expansión, and just listening to people, listening to the other, like, you know, we, we're really lucky in New Mexico, porque tenemos uh, mucha gente aquí que puede hablar de sus experiencias, entonces, uh, ese estudiante al escuchar al resto del grupo, mm -hmm. se quedó como, uh, muy inspirado, pudo cuestionar varias cosas que, uh, había internalizado, so there's, there's a lot of things. Yo también creo que o sea, es súper es, es importante compartir ¿verdad? con nuestros colegas en la, en la academia este tipo de pláticas, pero también más importante es, creo que es crear el ambiente ¿verdad? dentro de nuestras clases para que nuestros estudiantes puedan tener o sostener ese tipo de diálogos. ¿verdad? Y a veces ¿verdad? no solamente es cuestión de que nosotros seamos este gran atlas que sabe todo de CLA, de otros estudios y de literatura, sino también, ¿verdad? también vale la pena que los estudiantes compartan esos fondos de conocimiento que ellos traen a la clase, ¿verdad? Sea mínimo, máximo, sea, qué sé yo, que han leído todo el Quijote. Disculpen, ahí estoy hablando todo el Quijote. <risa> Pero creo que también es parte como nosotros como instructores, 
crear ese diálogo con los estudiantes. Uh -huh. uh, y como dijo Charles, voy a crear ese, ese tipo de bola de nieve, ese snowball uh, uh -huh. para realmente hacer un impacto, uh -huh. no solamente en la academia, sino también en la, en la, en la comunidad. Uh -huh. Que esto no se, no se quede en un círculo concéntrico, uh -huh. que se expanda. Uh -huh. Exactamente. Uh -huh. Entonces, so I'll try to be brief, but I have a lot floating around in my head, like added to, in addition to everything that was just said before me. One of the things that I particularly liked about this ideology and this critical approach is that it is a bit more tailored to uh, small groups and the individual and trying to help people shift their focus within the classroom. And when you usually think of critical theory, I think, especially in academia, we tend to think of like huge systemic changes and it makes these challenges seem almost insurmountable. And the thing that I really like is that you do use some concrete examples and texts that people can just already start to implement in their classrooms and how much of an impact you've already seen it can speak to in your coursework. Um, speaking to Marco's comment, like I, we talked about this a little bit in our SSL orientation, but I've also tried to incorporate in Spanish as a second language, because some of my students are inevitably, I try to send them all your way, but inevitably <laughs> some of my heritage speak speakers like to linger <laughs> for some reason or other, and because it's their schedule or, or modality or whatever. Um, but what I really try to do is try to emphasize the fact that there is a, a ton of linguistic variation in Spanish, mm -hmm. and that people should never be afraid to speak. Um, and I had even students speak with a South Carolina accent in Spanish. I'm like, that's fine. That's because, you know, it's, you know, as long as I can understand, you can understand me, we're doing great. Mm -hmm. um, and so just kind of creating, like you said, that I said, este ambiente mm -hmm. de, de diversidad lingüística. And I think it's really important. And then also, mm -hmm. instead of having my students investigate culture from Oaxaca or something like that, I'm like, go to the National Hispanic Cultural Center, see what they're doing there. Like, we do have an abundance yeah. of resources mm -hmm. here. Um, and even in places like California, I mean, there are obviously pockets and lots of Chicano populations that people can go and experience as well. So I like that idea. And then going back to um, when you were talking about positionality and that critical approach, it made me think a lot of decolonization. Mm -hmm. And it's something that was never said, but I'm sure is like kind of in the back of oh, your yeah. mind. Oh, yeah. Most definitely, because it's all there. But, yeah. but once again, I kind of like this approach of taking it um, specifically with ling uh, language and identity and connecting it down to because it shows the social value and power of mm -hmm. language. And I think that's really well done. And I think that could be your example, mm -hmm. even that concrete example of how she specifically uses her regional dialect to do that. Yeah. And it made me think a lot of my work in Sakme with reclaiming um, indigenous language in Scandinavia. And a lot of the experiences I hear from my students here who are like heritage language, it's that same kind of intergenerational pain mm -hmm. and trauma that they're dealing with, with schools and things like that. And just kind of the need for that healing, as Lucinto was saying. So, just like the, that's another kind of layer of the value of this work is also yeah, addressing yeah. that. It's, it's a lot, but in in addressing that intergenerational yeah. trauma and getting people to speak again, right? To kind of overcome yeah. that self alienation. And that is a little bit different, I think, than teaching it as a second language. Like you still want to incorporate those kind of principles in that curricula, but there's, a, there's this distinction, I feel like, and a positionality that's slightly different. Yeah. when you're having to deal with that self-alienation. For sure, lots. thank you for the comment. I mean, I don't think that we would all be here if we didn't believe that we could uh, all contribute to change, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and so, yeah, it does deal with the systemic things, the bigger things, but you know, how, how, how do you get individuals to feel like <laughs> it's not so overwhelming yeah. that they must, you know, how, how, how can you get people to feel like, you know, like a little colondrina that's going to put out the forest fire one drop at a time <laughs> instead of, you know, just like, oh, you know, I'm just going to give up and, you know, watch YouTube videos. Yeah, thank you. I think that's comments. really valuable. I think that's yeah. really valuable. Yeah, colonialism is a system. It's a blueprint. The uh, same things happen, uh, you know, the world over when there's an oppressive state that, you know, colonizes a group. It's, uh -huh. you know, kind of startling how similar, you know, uh, the outcomes are in, in linguistic terms, which is what I can talk uh -huh. about. But yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, what? Yes. You know, just ahead, the other, I was looking at the previous mention of the is especially for those who are teaching classes in Spanish or in any other language, is that the bilingualism is good. Like it's good to incorporate elements of the two languages to produce our lessons or our way of interacting with our students. Because, like, 
Yo no aprendí español en espacio donde yo podía usar inglés. Mm -hmm. Había un dialecto muy específico y se hablaba así. Y si me equivocaba, me lo decían directamente en mi cara. Mm -hmm. Así que cuando comencé en ese programa, me gustaba muchísimo usar Spanglish porque fue completo, yo, para mí, eso fue completamente fuera de lo usual para mí. Mm -hmm. Así que indicarles, porque, like, we're talking about, you know, different types of trauma, but, you know, also just our experiences, like, when you learn a language in a space where you're supposed to only use that language, only use it in that way, yeah, it's hard to suddenly come in and say, okay, so there's actually four words that you can use to say this. <laughs> yeah. When you're taught, no, there's one word, and that's yeah. what's right. And so clearly indicating to the people that you are presenting for, you know, like, it is okay, vivimos en un mundo, en un mundo bilingüe, y esos temas de lenguaje de español son, in, like, inherently transnational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, really expressing that, that these things are okay, they are appropriate for classroom settings, and they are beneficial for us and our students. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, I mean, sometimes we, you know, nosotros somos muy translegueros, <laughs> we call switcheros, for us, es muy natural. So sometimes we forget that it's salient, but... Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, try to be mindful of the hour. Uh, and so thank you all for hanging out with us. We're going to be here if you have more comments. Uh, I am grateful for your presence, and uh, I thank you for your comments that will uh, enrich in not only uh, the presentation that we're about to give, but, you know, I'd love to write this up because I've had an obsession with, you know, uh, I actually did snuck off to a rum class one time and gave a presentation on how Atzaldua was right, and you can, uh, you know, use this quantitative sociolinguistic data to support it. But, uh, so thank you all for coming, and, uh, you know,